as you can see, this is the uh, 787 Dreamlighter battery fire uh, investigation webinar. Basically, I'm going to go through some of the facts of what's gone on up to now, some of the, the status of what's happening with the two major investigations with the NTSB and the Japanese equivalent, the JTSB, and also to address any questions that you all might have. And I'm scanning through our current um, people who are in, and I see no one with a raised hand. So I'm assuming there are no immediate questions. I'm looking in the question box, no immediate questions. So without further ado, let me go into the presentation. Well, the, a little bit of background let me, before I go into the battery types. As we all know, there were two significant battery fires with the 787. One happened on the 7th of January in Boston. The plane was at the, uh, was at the tarmac. There was a maintenance crew, cleaning crew inside. Smoke was detected coming in and firefighters were called out, and the battery that's in the APU compartment, which is in the rear uh, section uh, of the aircraft, caught fire. There was smoke. There was an injured firefighter, but other than that, there was no major damage to the airplane. There was some damage immediately around the battery. Now, roughly a week later in Japan, uh, let's go to the picture of the jet. There was an ANA 787. By the way, the Boston event was a JAL aircraft. There was an ANA aircraft en route between, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Ube, Japan, and Tokyo, Japan. Shortly after takeoff, there were smoke detected. They diverted to another city, the name of which I'm not going to try and mispronounce, where they had an emergency evacuation. There were several minor injuries of passengers, but other than that, everyone was okay. As you can see, the airplane on the taxiway there after the evacuation. Shortly after the first event, the NTSB launched a major investigation, even though this was technically an incident, not an accident. Given the situation, which is, A, we have a brand new aircraft model, the 787, which has basically been in operation a little over a year. First carrier to operate the aircraft was coincidentally ANA. There were about 48 or so in service around the world, including six at United at the time of the event. And shortly after the fire of, these, uh, of the first aircraft and of the second aircraft, the FAA and the equivalent bodies around the world essentially grounded the 787. Has not been flying for about a month now. There are roughly 48 airplanes in total. I believe about 17 to 18 of them were ANA, another half dozen or so with uh, JAL, and they had far and away the most operational experience. They had been flying the aircraft in ANA's case since late 2011. United only got the aircraft in the last few months. And the other carriers around the world, for example, Air India was one of them, had only had a handful of aircraft, maybe three with that airline. They've only been flying a few months. They're all on the ground right now, and the investigation is ongoing. Like I said, there's a major investigation with the JTSB, another major investigation with the NTSB. Now, just to give you an idea of what these batteries look like, this is the battery from the Japanese aircraft. As you as you can see on the left-hand side, you have the NTSB representative over in Japan and the JTSB investigator. They're looking at the battery down here. And roughly speaking, it's bigger than a car battery, and it's not a huge device. But as you can see, this particular one was pretty burned out. And if I go forward here, I believe we have another picture. This is, again, from the JTSB report, which shows the front area of the aircraft where the main battery resides. This is the one with the Japanese aircraft that caught fire. And the APU compartment battery, the APU battery rather, which is in a rear electrical compartment here, this one was undamaged. In the January 7th event in Boston, it was the APU battery back here which caught fire. But both batteries have a very similar layout. This is sort of an overhead schematic of looking at the battery cell. There, there are eight cells within this lithium ion battery. Let's uh, go over to, again, we, we looked at this before. This is the route of flight on the 16th, and the fact they landed, had an emergency evacuation. This is another outside uh, shot of the ANA aircraft over in Japan. And the arrows, I don't know if you'll be able to see it on, on, your, on your screens, it's pointing to an area on the left side of the fuselage where there was a smoke trail left on the side of the fuselage, whoops, after all was said and done. So there was smoke detected inside the cockpit. Smoke exited the aircraft as well. 
And again, there was no major uh, injuries because of the smoke. There are some minor injuries because of the evacuation. Now, before uh, I go into more about this, I'd like to do a little bit of background on batteries. Now, bear with me as I go to the battery basics uh, slide. The battery that's used on the 787 is a lithium ion battery, which is uh, something fairly common for your laptops and your cell phones, has not been used up to now in large commercial aircraft. So typical use of the batteries, many different kinds of batteries, and lead acid batteries are the common batteries you would see in cars. Many of you who, who've driven have been around those kinds of batteries. There are also aircraft batteries that use uh, lead acid. Although for large commercial aircraft, nickel cadmium batteries are far more common for a large commercial aircraft. Nickel metal hydride batteries used often in power tools. And of course, the lithium ion battery, which cell phone, consumer electronics, laptops, and now in a large commercial aircraft. Different chemical compositions, different electrical characteristics for each of these batteries causes different uh, positive and negative aspects. For example, the lithium ion battery, when it's overcharged, has a propensity to overheat and catch fire, much more so than some of these other batteries. Partly as a result, oh, this is a, a chart that compares the energy density on the left-hand side, the y-axis, versus the power density, the x-axis. And as you can see, in this area here, we have lead acid in the lower left, nickel cadmium in the orange in the middle, and lithium ion, which is in the upper right of this group. And because this is a logarithmic scale, it may be hard to see, but basically the lead acid battery would have on the order of energy density of, of uh, roughly five to 10 versus lithium ion, which is close to 100. Power density, uh, watts per kilogram. Lead acid would be down in the one to five range. Lithium ion would be well over 100. So there are particular advantages to using this type of battery. And we already talked about the two significant battery events. And I'd like to talk first about some of the issues that have, some of the questions that came in before this presentation, some of which uh, centered on battery issues. And I'd like to discuss that in the context of these, uh, of this investigation. One of the questions that came up, and frankly, one that was fairly common, do you have to use lithium ion batteries? Can these be replaced, used by a tried and true battery until this situation can be resolved? The answer is yes, it could. Technically, it's feasible. There are batteries that have been approved for aircraft use for large aircraft like this. And it's possible that you can engineer the system to put this different kind of battery in there. However, uh, certifying an aircraft is a long and drawn out process. And this aircraft was certified with the lithium ion batteries. To go through a process of recertifying a different kind of battery for use of this aircraft could take weeks, could take months. So although it's possible, it's something that will likely not be done unless there's no alternative to it. Another basic question, can the airlines maintain their schedules without the 787? Quick answer there, it depends on the airline. Obviously the 787 has some unique characteristics, one of which is having a particularly economic uh, cost per passenger mile for very long routes that have not very heavy traffic. For example, the one that caught fire in Boston, it was flying routinely between Boston and Tokyo. There is nothing else out there that has the same passenger capacity, cargo capacity, et cetera, and can fly nonstop from Tokyo to uh, Boston in an economical way. So they won't be able to maintain their schedule with a nonstop flight between Boston and Tokyo, but uh, Japan Airlines is a large airline. They have alternatives that they can do. And again, that's more of a business decision on the part of the airline, whether they do another aircraft in their fleet, whether they stop flying the route entirely, whether or not they put passengers on other aircraft. That all depends. Another question that came up is, uh, which has to do more with the smoke aspects of what went on as opposed to the battery aspects. Uh, why doesn't the FAA require vision assurance devices for smoke-filled cockpits? Now, a little backstory, a couple of years ago, a little over a couple of years ago, there was a UPS crash in the Middle East, a uh, UPS cargo aircraft. And there was an onboard fire and the crew put on their smoke goggles and oxygen mask and such, but they still had difficulty seeing the instrument panel. And some of the recommendations that came out 
from the NTSB. Didn't specifically address uh, getting something I can assure that you could see the cockpit, but address the issue of what kind of smoke goggles, smoke goggles and oxygen masks are used in aircraft. And without going into detail, the NTSB had a recommendation that the FAA require certain changes, including using a full fast, full face one piece device, as opposed to some of the two piece devices, goggles plus oxygen masks that are used out there. That doesn't directly address the question this person asked, but this, this is being looked at by the FAA. They haven't made any regulatory changes yet. And what is the wiring diagram for this battery and related systems? Frankly, I don't know, honestly. I don't have the schematics for that or access to that. And I'm not privy to that information from Boeing, so I really can't uh, speak to that. But uh, my suggestion is to pay close attention to the investigation as it unfolds. It's very likely that as part of the investigation, very likely that as part of the investigation, the NTSB will have fairly detailed information about the aircraft, including relevant diagrams and such. There was a, just as an aside, there was a FAA research a few years back in 19, 2006 that talked about smoke in the cockpit, talking about air carrier events in their records. This is just from a essentially a three-month period seven years ago, where they were looking at the number of events for air carriers and what the effects were, uh, diversions, evacuations, air turn back, and other smoke events. And as you can see, if you have a big enough screen, that is, uh, between February and March, there are roughly 130 or so total events. And of those events, less than 10 of them resulted in evacuations of the aircraft. So this isn't to speak directly to the battery event because there wasn't a breakdown as to which of these were caused by electrical systems or battery, but uh, specifically by, by batteries. But it just goes to show you that smoke events are fairly common in air carrier aircraft. And you do have effects on the flight, such as returns, to the airport, diversions or evacuations. If my machine will allow that to happen. Uh, so there was a question asked about the new technology on the 787, if the lithium ion batteries were put in there because of the new technology that's in there. And very briefly, there are about three major differences with the 787 versus earlier Boeing aircraft, such as the 777. One, is an increased use of electrically powered devices to run the aircraft. Devices and systems that used to be powered by hydraulics in some cases are now powered by electrics. And the electrical generating capacity of the 787 much higher than you would have on the 777. But the batteries weren't used to power those systems. They're electrical generators run by the engine and other parts of the aircraft that do that. And the batteries are important but the increased electrical loads and requirements of the aircraft did not directly lead to those batteries. These batteries happen to be smaller and more powerful compared to the alternatives, and they have different operating characteristics. And for those reasons, which I can't speak to specifically, Boeing decided a long time ago to go this direction. Uh, by the way, um, it goes to the next question. Was the FAA certification process, what was the FAA certification process for this new battery type? And I have a reference to the Federal Register back in uh, 2007, where they basically said, A, this is a new kind of battery. It hasn't been used in aircraft before. B, it has different characteristics, especially different failure characteristics. Therefore, C, you'll have to have a special kind of qualification for this in order for this to be certified. Uh, if you go online and look up this document, it doesn't go specifically into what Boeing did, but it did lay out the fact that this was a recognized problem years before the aircraft went into service, which was recognized while the aircraft was in the design and, and early production phase. So any problems that have come up because of batteries are certainly not new, nor were they unanticipated by the FAA or by, the, by Boeing. Now, moving forward to the investigation, let's go back in time first. You may recall that during the time the fires happened, there were other 787 events going on. Uh, there was the fire in Boston, which clearly got a lot of attention in the States. And a week later, you had the fire in Japan. But around the time that the fire in Boston happened, a whole lot of news reports are coming out about relatively minor events, all involving the 787. 
uh, false warnings during takeoff, causing an uh, ejected takeoff, windshields cracking because of heating issues, and other issues involving the 787. There was actually a, a diversion into New Orleans by United Aircraft uh, some months ago. And also, earlier there had been a fire uh, during immediately after production in, in the South Carolina plant for Boeing, where there was a problem with the aircraft. This is before it was delivered to a, a carrier. It was dealt with. The aircraft wasn't seriously damaged. But what happened is you had a whole lot of things happening and a whole lot of attention, some of it good, some of it eh, questionable in the media, about the 787. So the official sources of information I just listed there were Boeing and the two investigating authorities. Those are the official sources of information that myself and a lot of other outsiders rely on to find out what's happening with the current investigation. Now, when it comes to the investigation, plus all the earlier things that went on, as all of us know, the media landscape has changed radically since even the days of the 777. Now, I was personally at, uh, involved in that program. I was at Boeing at the time as a safety engineer, and I was involved in some aspects of that. And although there was uh, plenty of media of attention, and we did have the internet back then, this was the internet that was literally before Google. There were search engines, there was no Google. You could actually put p pictures and videos online, but it was really, really difficult. And a lot of people had very slow machines that made it very difficult to make that happen. So there was, quote unquote, social media such as it was, email and other ways that people would communicate. Individuals in small groups putting together websites. But absolutely nothing like what we have today. Something happens anywhere in the world. You've got your Instagram. You've got, your, and I said blogger here, that's just a generic stand-in for all of the user-generated online websites that you can have, blogger, WordPress, all the other things that are out there. You have Google Alerts, where if you happen to be interested in FA battery issues, you can go into Google and have it email you an update daily, hourly, or instantaneously whenever something comes up in the news that deals with your subject of interest. You have Facebook where people might share their personal experiences of, oh gosh, I was on this airplane, I was in an emergency evacuation, it was so terrible, et cetera, et cetera. My favorite over on the upper left here is LinkedIn, which I sort of call it Facebook for serious working people. That is ways for professionals who could be widely separated around the world to at least have some sort of community and even organize groups around us, an area of interest. So it's sort of like a semi-private network between people who have a common interest. So you have sort of insulated pockets of communities talking about it, about these things. You have other things like YouTube, which is by its very nature, a broadcast sort of medium, but designed for the individual. So anything happens, boom, it becomes instantly seen around the world. It could be picked up as a national or even international story. So by way of explanation, I wanted to go into this because 15 years ago or so, almost 20 years ago, during the development of the 777, the industry had a bit of a luxury in that if something went badly or if a minor problem cropped up, it would be known and it wouldn't be hidden, but it was just more difficult to access the, access the information. There would have been a different kind of public pressure had something like this happened early in the 777 era, simply because we have a different communication protocol in place around the world. Now, again, for my education as to find out what are people actually asking about when it comes to this, uh, Google has a lot of tools, most of them free. By the way, I'm not a paid stooge of Google, although if they want to send me some money for this free PR, my address is on the website. But as you know, everyone that you know, probably yourself, uses Google to search on a regular basis. Google compiles this information, and they have things like Google Trends where you can ask questions of it. So for those of you who may not be able to see it, on the left-hand side, I typed in four queries. Well, 787, where United also had to be in the news headline. 787, where ANA, one of the aircraft uh, airlines involved, had to be in the headline. 787 in battery, 787 in JAL. I wanted to get a, a feeling of what's being searched for. And I'm sorry about that. I just took you off the page. Now we're back on the page. And what I did was a search for the last 90 days. And as you can see, there's a noticeable spike right about here, which is about the time of the 
a fire over at ANA over in Japan. And over the last 90 days, you can see that there's been, the top line here, which is blue, has been the heaviest amount of searching, which happens to be for 787 and United. Not surprising, United is the only U.S. airline that's flying the 787. So anything that happened with United would be a newsworthy thing. And there is about an equal amount of searching for 787 and battery and 787 and ANA. Surprisingly, even though you had a big spike during the time that they had their problem over in Boston, there was relatively little searching for 787 and JAL. Now, this is very likely a function in part because Google is primarily used by the English-speaking world, and maybe there's a lot of interest in Japan for this, but they may not necessarily be searching through Google for it. But this is just to get, gauge how popular the subject is. Bottom line, the 787 is a very popular subject. When it gets in the news, like it did during the battery fires, it becomes even more popular. Now, I'm looking at the question box, and I have another question. From Khalil, thank you very much for the question. When batteries caught fire, what was the situation of the battery's cable? Uh, that I don't know. I've looked at the reports out of the NTSB, read what little they've had in the incident report and in the docket of information they have for the major investigation. They haven't gotten into that level of detail yet. Now, as it turns out, the Japanese um, report of their fire incident did speak about some of the battery cables, but they weren't very clear in what that was. And I'm going to do something a little unusual here. I'm going to see if, whoops, let me cancel that. I almost accidentally ended the webinar. Let me very carefully cancel that so that doesn't happen. Okay. I trust that the webinar is still active. I have just switched the screen, so now you're going to see a generic uh, screen for my PowerPoint. I'm going to switch over to where I had the Japanese uh, investigation. Okay. Let me go to the page where that they gave some information about that. That was probably on the other one. By the way, the JTSB has come up with two reports, which they publish on their website. The reports are in Japanese, but they are available for download, and you can review them at your leisure. Scrolling down, okay. Here is the page on the Japanese investigation where they talked about cables related to the battery. I don't know which cables these are, but this question gives me an excellent opportunity to demonstrate something. One of the greatest tools of the Internet is language translation. Google, which has something called Google Translate, allows you to uh, translate from one language to another. So if you note, there's some Japanese characters here. I have no idea what they are. I'm going to go over to Google Translate and see if I can translate them. Bear with me for a moment. Now, there's a bit of a lag with the video. So uh, although I'm already at Google Translate, I'm seeing on my other screen that it hasn't quite shown up on everyone's screens yet, but it will soon. So I'll wait a bit. OK, we're on Google Translate. I put into the left-hand side the Japanese characters. Google automatically recognizes us as, ja as Japanese, and our default is to translate it into English. And this translation is, ground wire of the enclosure battery is disconnected. So we know what that says. Do we know what it means? Answer, I don't know. Because as you can see, it's disconnected. This is not a normal looking battery cable. It's unclear to me whether this happened during the fire, after the fire, as a result of the firefighting efforts, I'm just not sure. And uh, well, the answer may be here. Again, this wasn't something planned, but this could answer the question. I did translate this earlier, and I looked at it earlier. It didn't seem pertinent at the time, so I didn't go forward on it. But since that was on the immediate uh, subsequent slide, let's see if there's anything here that opens it up for us. They studied in more detail the situation of the cord, a battery cell damage. Again, this is Japanese to English. Forgive me if it doesn't sound uh, continuous or if it sounds disjointed. 
It will continue to investigate and timing of the disconnection of the ground wire to the chassis. So, something happened to the wiring. Exactly what? The Japanese aren't sure. They're looking into it. Okay, we're back. And a little background for everyone who's out there uh, about airsafe.com. Uh, we've been up and running since 96 when I started it way back then. And coincidentally, about two weeks before Flight 800 happened. And over the years, we've branched off into having the main website. There are various blogs that support it. We have a few YouTube channels as well as podcasts, which we've been putting out for about five or six years now. This is one of the first web webinars we've ever done where the information that shows up on the blogs or might show up in a podcast, we now have it in a live venue. This is to give an opportunity for the folks out there to ask us questions directly. To uh, If they, anything comes to mind that you think is important, I'm here for you. I'll do my best to answer the question. Going back a little bit to speaking about the investigation, the official sources of information are those who are involved in the investigation. And because investigations are run by the national authority where the incidents happen, that's why you have these two parallel, more or less, investigations involving the NTSB and the JTSB. The JTSB and the NTSB are similar in this regard. They are responsible for doing major investigations such as what's going on right now, but they themselves don't have a tremendous amount of resources. That is, they don't have all of the experts for propulsion, for electrical systems, for hydraulics, for landing gear, for all the various things that can go wrong with, a, with an accident happens. When there is an accident, typically the major parties who are involved in that accident become a party to the investigation. In the NTSB ca NTSB's case, this would be the airline that was involved, JAL, as well as the manufacturer that was involved, which is Boeing. Boeing, in turn, which has used subcontractors for most of the major components of this aircraft, including the batteries, uh, they would have to rely on the expertise of their subcontractors to figure out what's going on. So as we speak, there are people working at the NTSB, people working at the JTSB, people working throughout Boeing, throughout several of the involved uh, subcontractor companies. There could be other in, uh, people involved. For example, there could be feedback or information from the firefighters in both locations. All this is going on behind the scenes, and although the NTSB has a very good website that sort of lays out the basics of what's going on with the investigation, they're only giving a snapshot of it. They have briefings every now and then again. I believe their last briefing was February 7th, and the future briefings will depend on whether or not they find anything. They could find out something within days. They could find out something within weeks. Maybe they won't find out something for months. As far as what will happen to the aircraft, Will this grounding affect uh, Boeing for a long time to come? That remains to be seen. As one of the uh, earlier questions pointed out, can the air airlines maintain their schedule without the 787? I've answered that before. They may, may or may not, depending on their situation, depending on what alternatives they had. The other question is, what's Boeing going to do about this? While the aircraft is grounded, they have very limited numbers of things they can do with the aircraft. In fact, they have to get special op authorization from the NTSB just to fly the aircraft around for, for a test flight. And they do have at least one aircraft actively involved in test flights right now to try and get to the bottom of the battery issue. Boeing is still producing the 787, roughly about five a month, I believe, was the last recorded uh, rate of production. So since this happened, maybe another five airplanes have rolled off the assembly line. So they're sitting on the ground somewhere in Charleston, South Carolina, or Everett, Washington, which are the two manufacturing locations, and they will not be allowed to fly until the FAA gives them authority, authority to fly them. And again, that could be weeks, that could be months. Long term, what will this do to Boeing's uh, production and sales of the 787 remains to be seen. This was an event that happened fairly early in the 787's career. They have several hundred, I believe it's over 500 on order. They've only delivered about 50. And given the advantages of this aircraft, uh, different kind of uh, atmosphere in the cabin, they have actually higher pressure and higher humidity inside the passenger cabin, so it's more comfortable. You have bigger windows. You have much better fuel efficiency. And you have other options that the airlines can do with these aircraft, primarily fly them between cities that were not economically feasible before. 
there are a number of advantages to this aircraft where there's a demand for it and there will be a demand for years to come. So although it's grounded now, it seems reasonable that at some point they'll be allowed to fly them again. What isn't clear is whether or not that can only happen after major design changes, additional testing, uh, changes of procedures. There's any number of things that can happen. It's unclear at this point which one is the most likely. So we'll have to wait for A, the results of the investigations of the JTSB and the NTSB. B, whether or not the, look to see whether or not the FAA and similar organizations around the world, primarily the European uh, uh, Certification Authority, will require that changes be made to the aircraft that are major. Now, it's very likely, this isn't too much of a stretch, that at some point the FAA will, admit, uh, it will issue at least one airworthiness directive, probably more, concerning the aircraft. What that airworthiness uh, directive will, will contain remains to be seen. So I'm not in the speculation business. I'm only going with what's out there. And although there's a whole lot of information bandied back and forth between various people in the media and the government, there's not a whole lot of answers as to what will happen in the near future. Now, while I was talking, I've had a few more questions and thank all of you for those questions. Is anyone from the NTSB or FAA online with us? Well, Matt, I don't know because I asked for very limited information when people registered, basically your name, email address, and whether or not you were uh, uh, wanted to be on the mailing list. Now, I could uh, go on the side and look through the mailing list, but again, you could be from the FAA or NTSB and use a private email. I respect that. So I will say this. There is a hand going up. Axel, I'm going to unmute you, and maybe you can shed some light on the situation. Hello, Axel. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you for uh, raising your hand, and we uh, would like to hear what you have to say. Yeah, actually, I'm working in automotive industry, and we are dealing with problems like this almost uh, every project. And especially if the solution is not known in terms of timeline, it is common to have a backup solution being under development. So my question, do you know anything whether something is already being prepared as a backup solution in terms that the uh, current battery problem will not be tracked down to a root cause and being solved within a certain time frame? I don't know if there's a backup system in work right now, but it certainly seems reasonable that the, that the involved companies would have that. Now, by backup system, let me be careful and say that the battery problem that happened was part of a battery system. You have the battery itself. You have the electrical connections within the battery components. You have the controlling mechanisms outside of the battery, which includes hardware and software. And then you have the connection with the larger aircraft uh, avionics systems. So it may turn out that part of the system might be in trouble. Part of the system may have to be replaced. It could be hardware, such as the batteries. It could be software. It could be some combination of that. Now, whether or not the various companies have a backup plan in place, I don't know. Any kind of change like that, where you would change out some part of the system, would have to be retested. It may have to be recertified. And it may be a very long and drawn out process that will involve more than one company. So I suspect, although I have no proof, I suspect that if some sort of alternative is proposed and they'll go forward with it, we'll hear about it because it's not something that could be done in isolation. Uh, either the NTSB and the FAA would have to sign off on it or more than co one company or more than one entity would have to be involved in coming up with that solution. Uh, the, uh, Axel, do you have any uh, follow-up questions or comments? No, thank you. Uh, thank you for your contribution. I'm going to mute you You're again. Welcome. I'm going to mute you again, and uh, if anyone else has a, a question they'd like to uh, ask, by all means. I have no other hands up, and this may mean that you'll all have to uh, listen to my, my voice talk about something else. So let me go to a question. Good. There's another question here, again from Khalil. Was the battery compatible to the AC load requirements? AC, I'm assuming you mean the aircraft load requirements. 
In general, the answer is yes, because it had to be certified to work within the aircraft system that was that was designed. Whether that was the case at the time of the incident, of the incidents, that I don't know. What has been released by the two or, uh, investigative organizations were not detailed to that level. It may come out later that uh, that is an issue, but so far, none of the preliminary reports have stated anything along those lines. Our next question from David. Uh, thank you from, for the question. Is United maintaining the 787 in San Francisco? I've heard they may be outsourcing heavy maintenance offshore. Uh, a little bit of history for those of you who are out there. Uh, United has had a very, very big presence in San Francisco for decades, including a very large and significant maintenance base. Also, uh, this, uh, this is part of what was the norm for the airlines, especially back in the days before deregulation, which in the U.S. started in 1979. Airlines, major airlines like United, in a sense, were protected from economic reality in that ticket prices were fixed by the government. They really couldn't undercut everybody willy-nilly and drive each other out of business. So United was allowed its certain sphere of influence, as was the other major airlines of the day. Airlines back then owned their own aircraft. They did maintenance on their own aircraft hired their own crews, hired their own flight attendants. They basically had a vertical organization for most of the aspects of running the airline. Fast forward to the day, because of the regulation and economic reality, a lot of what airlines used to do in-house is now done outside. You could have various kinds of maintenance done by specialists in that. It could be onshore in the U.S., it could be offshore. You have aircraft that are very likely leased rather than owned sometimes including the cost of fuel and such. You have pilots who may not be lifetime employees of that airline, but who may be there temporarily. For example, with the new fast-growing airlines in the Middle East it's quite, and in China, it's quite common for them to take experienced pilots from stateside and from elsewhere and have them fly outside of their home country. Without digressing too much, pilot pay in the U.S. has dropped dramatically. An entering pilot at a small regional air, airline who wants to move up to fly with the major airlines may have to put up with a pay scale that's on the order of 20000 a year when they first start, which uh, may sound like a lot if you're a single person and you know, have no commitments. But typically, someone who's going to be an airline pilot has put in thousands of hours of their time behind the in the cockpit flying, have spent tens of thousands of dollars for their education, be it a college education or specialist education for aviation. And they could have, if they've gone privately the whole way, a very significant bill to pay. And frankly, the starting salaries of airlines may not be enough to do that. Add to that if they wanted to have a normal life, a nice, not even a, a nice house, but a decent place to live, being able to support a family. It's difficult to do that at that kind of wage, especially if the pilot can't afford to live in the same place where the airline's flying. That's an entirely different webinar. So in answer to the question, are they outsourcing their heavy maintenance? I don't know if they are, but outsourcing heavy maintenance is something that's very common for airlines around the world. And I don't specifically know United's situation. Another question from Bilio. With reference to the technical possibilities in the Middle East, what do you think the uh, 787 will be operating in the Middle East? Oh, when do you think the 787 will be operating in the Middle East? Well, it was already operating in the Middle East before all this happened. One of the uh, carriers was a Middle Eastern carrier. And if you bear with me for a while, I can look up and see who that was. I want to say it was Emirates. I could be wrong on that. And they had three aircraft at the time that uh, the grounding happened. And looking at the tails of at least of those aircraft that are lined up in Everett, at least one of those aircraft that have been produced but waiting to be delivered is going to a Middle Eastern carrier. So there's a market for it. They're, they were already flying there. And it seems reasonable that they will continue to fly there. Going back to the early question, is anyone from the FAA or the NTSB online with us? I don't know if, that's the, if, if anyone is. But I will say this. Like I said before, this uh, webinar is being recorded. I will have an edited version of it available online, primarily a, a video via YouTube. And there'll be links to it, extensive links to it on airsafe.com, especially at the 787 page at 787.airsafe.com. And if you know anyone in the FAA or the NTSB who'd like to take a look at it, 
invite them to go to the video and check it out. If any of them would like to add their opinions later on, by all means, contact me. But uh, I will say this, having been inside the aviation industry, typically, if you're working for a government organization or, or, or a company, if you say anything, it will be you as an individual saying it, not representing that organization. So when it comes to anyone from an organization saying something about an airplane or an air accident investigation, what they say may be valid, what they say may be true, but I tend to defer to any official statements that come out. Now, the official statements could be complete nonsense, but that's my first uh, response is to go with what the official statements are. And by the way, to their credit, Boeing has put together a page where they have answered a lot of common questions about the investigation, about the technology of the 787, about why the battery is different. If you go to that page, 787.airsafe.com, uh, one of the links I just put on there an hour or so ago was a link to that Boeing page. And this is going a little bit ahead of the game here, but I'm going to go to the end of the slideshow where I have some contact information. Most of you who were are here today were already subscribers to the mailing list. But if you're not a subscriber to the mailing list, go to subscribe.airsafe.com and sign up. Anytime there's an update, major update to the investigation, you'll be notified. Anytime we have new things to offer like webinars or downloadable eBooks, that sort of thing, we'll announce it through the mailing list. Now, 787.airsafe.com is the address I just mentioned for the 787 page. It's fairly sparse right now. It has a brief uh, mention of the two incidents. It has some links that are relevant, including right now what I think is the most important link, links, the link to the Boeing page that gives you more information and the link to the NTSB page where they have all of their information, public information about the investigation available in one spot. And again, uh, every time I do webinars like this, there will be a slide like this in it that says, hey, for more information, go here or go there because whatever I put in the webinar is already going to be out there somewhere on the websites of the blogs of airsafe.com, or it will be soon. And in the case of the 787, that address on the bottom, 787.airsafe.com, will be essentially the headquarters for 787 information for some time to come. I'm looking for more questions, and I think I have some more questions. Can I have a recording of this webinar in my email? Uh, I would say no for the following reason. The video, once it's produced, is rather large on the order of like several hundred megabytes. And the easiest thing I've found is to go and upload it to YouTube, which hosts it all on their servers and I don't have to worry about it. There are some services out there where if you just wanted the audio portion of this, you can actually go to YouTube, type in the address where the YouTube video is, and it will automatically strip off the audio for it and allow you to download it. So instead of several hundred megabytes, it might be several dozen megabytes. And the service I use, mediaconverter.com or mediaconverter.org. I can't remember the address exactly, but I've used their service for a long time. You can convert up to five videos a day. I've used it to convert a video from YouTube format to an MP4 format or an MOV format or WMV format. I've also used it to take audio from a video and just strip off the audio. So mediaconverter.org or mediaconverter.com, excellent service, doesn't cost a penny. And also, somewhere on the Boeing website, there's going to be a public affairs office or a media office. They might have other statements, press statements coming out about it. But as far as how the investigation is going, specific as to what caused it and all that, Boeing will defer to the NTSB. So if you want to find out what's going on with respect to what went wrong and what has to be fixed, Ultimately, so ultimately, it's going to come out of the NTSB, not out of Boeing. But for background information, frequently asked questions, by all means, go visit Boeing. Uh, Dave, uh, your quote before the question. This was fantastic. Thank you very much. If you all uh, found this to be useful, that was my, my goal, and I'm happy to make that happen. And David, uh, just in general, uh, one of the reasons why I really wanted to go with the webinar is that uh, the Internet has been changing since the internet was invented. Could you imagine just how difficult it would be to do this if we had no World Wide Web? I could do all the writing I wanted. I could record all the stuff I wanted to. I'd have to nail things to telephone posts. 
I'd have to have a physical mailing list where I'd physically mail off newsletters. I might have an international reach, but it would be at the speed of the post office. Now, you and I and everyone else who's in the industry and even people outside the industry have access to tools that are on a par on one level with what only the largest governments or largest news organizations had 20 years ago. And we have the power not to broadcast, but to narrowcast. That is getting our message, whatever it may be, positive or negative, getting our message to a crowd of people who are interested in it. Presumably, because again, the magic of social media, if you have LinkedIn and you think this was a great uh, session, you might link a, a, you mail out a link to the 787 page or might mail out a link to the video when it's produced. Same thing for those of you who are on Facebook. You can uh, do something with your Facebook crowd or you can do something as simple as liking me on Facebook or asking for a connection via LinkedIn. By the way, if you have LinkedIn, ask me for a connection. I'd be happy to connect with you and you'd be uh, in line to get uh, direct messages from LinkedIn in the future. If you have Facebook, airsafe.com has a Facebook page. By all means, you can link into that. I will say this. I don't do a lot of Facebook. I do do a lot of LinkedIn. So if you have to choose between the two, LinkedIn is my favorite. Twitter, airsafe.com is a Twitter account. It may surprise you, but the username is airsafe. So if you go to twitter.com slash airsafe, you'll see our Twitter stream. You can sign up for that and connect to us that way. You can sign up on the mailing list. You can even sign up just for being notified when the blog has a new post. If you don't want the general emails, just want the blog updates, you can go to the blog, airsafenews.com, and sign up there. We have a lot of ways for you to get in, in touch with us, a lot of ways to keep in contact. And whatever works for you, by all means, use it. And always, plain old email works, tcurtis at airsafe.com. We're just out about, just about out of time. In fact, it is just past three o'clock. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. And if there are any last second questions, I'll take them. And if there are any last second hands being held up, I don't see any, I'll answer those questions. But if that's all, I'll give folks a few more seconds to type stuff in. If not, we're going to end it there.